Welcome to Plant Your Seed. I'm your host, Fred Ferris. On each episode, we share stories of how ordinary people have transformed their lives. Each story is compassionate, each story is authentic, and each story is a transformation. Here are the stories of the people who are changing our world by transitioning to a plant-based diet. Today on Plant Your Seed, joining us from Canada, we have Anna Pippis. Anna is the author of The Vegan Family Cookbook, a cookbook and strategy manual to make everyday plant-based cooking easier. Her work will be published by Appetite by Random House later this year. Welcome, Anna. Thank you so much, Fred. It's really nice to be here with you. Thank you for being here. It's so great to have you on the show. Thanks for inviting me. I would love to start with when and why did you transition to a plant-based diet? Sure. So I actually became vegetarian as a kid when I was about 12 years old. I This was um, in the 90s, the, the mid 90s. And there wasn't really, you know, there was no internet. And um, I didn't really, there was no vegetarian community in the small town where I was living. But I met a vegetarian and it and I was a big animal lover. And it occurred to my young mind that, hey, if vegetarians are a thing, I want to be a vegetarian. My parents were big meat eaters. They loved, you know, steak and ribs and all that kind of stuff. But they were also very supportive and encouraging parents. And so when I said I wanted to go vegetarian, they embraced that and they supported me by buying me cookbooks and by cooking, you know, really fabulous vegetarian meals like lentil soup and moussaka. Um, and we would just kind of happily coexist. I with my vegetarian diet, my parents with their meat heavy diet. Um, and you know, even at that time I was really the only vegetarian more or less that I knew, certainly the only one of my friend group. And it very much felt to me like a personal choice. This was just something that I did. I chose the vegetarian option when I went to a restaurant. And at this time, I must say my diet was very heavy on the cheese. Um, and I also ate eggs and drank milk and had a, you know, kind of a standard diet minus the meat. Right. A little bit later in my life, when I was in my early 20s, I I learned, I, I, first of all, I heard of veganism and it just kind of like entered my psyche in a way that I thought, this, this makes sense for me. This is probably something that I'm going to do. So around 2008, I started moving towards a vegan diet. At that time, um, you know, there, there was no vegan cheese, really. There was very little in the way of vegan milk. And, um, you know, I tried it all. I loved tea. And so I tried different rice milk and soy milk, pretty much whatever my grocery store had in my tea. And it was all kind of disappointing. The vegan cheese, there was almost none. And what there was, was, tr I mean, truly inedible, <laughs> especially mm -hmm. for a big cheese connoisseur like I used to be. Uh, and so it took me a couple of years, maybe a year and a half to really just learn new habits and eliminate these foods from my diet. But what happened was around 2000, early 2010, uh, my eyes were opened to the truth about what's happening to animals on farms. I, I've always been motivated by, um, by the animal side of veganism, of plant-based eating. And when I learned about what was going on inside farms and slaughterhouses, I was really horrified. And I started to look into, well, you know, is there an ethical egg? Is there ethical cheese? And I found that even in, in a best case scenario, what was going on just didn't sit right with me. And it didn't feel right to me to be purchasing and consuming these products anymore. So I made the decision to go vegan. And it was quite a natural, easy decision because by then I had sort of been trying it out. I had explored the different options. I had learned, you know, a new cooking repertoire. And I mean, already as a vegetarian, I was cooking lots of lentils and beans and tofu. So already this was quite natural for me. Um, and then once the, the sort of the animal piece for the dairy and eggs was in place, it became a very easy transition and I never looked back. But what happened? And then is I wasn't a health nut. I was just somebody who loved animals. So then what happened is when you go vegan, you start reading labels. And as a label reader, I realized, wow, I'm, I really want to be more mindful of what I put in my body. Some of these things that I'm eating are made with uh, ingredients that I'm not I don't know what they are, or maybe I'm not comfortable with them. They're not things that I would necessarily use in my own kitchen. And mm -hmm. so that's when I became a plant-based eater. So I say I'm vegan for the animals and I'm plant-based for myself. I prefer to eat and I feel best on, you know, a largely whole foods plant-based diet, although there's always room for Beyond Meat sausages or vegan ice cream once in a while. Um, but largely, you know, minimal oil, minimal processed food, lots of salads and green smoothies is how I feel great and how I have the energy to uh, do everything that I do. 
Going back to when you first became vegan, was there anything that triggered you? For me, it was seeing some of the documentaries and and things like that that kind of opened my eyes. Was there anything that triggered you into becoming vegan? Yeah, I would say so. I've always been a huge reader. I've always been very motivated by by words and the power of words. And so I read a book by a Canadian journalist called Charlotte Montgomery. The book is called Blood Relations. I think it's probably out of print now, which is too bad because it's a really fantastic uh, book, a really you know incredible piece of journalism. And she has d- different chapters on different ways that animals are sort of commodified and, and used and abused in Canada. And there was one chapter on animal farming, and she write, she wrote about this one particular story of a, of a bull, of a male you know, cow who was being brought to the slaughterhouse, and this poor bull had broken hips. Now, I, I, it's possible that I'm getting some of the details of this story wrong all these years later, right. so please forgive me, Charlotte Montgomery, if I'm getting any of these details wrong, but I'll, I'll do my best to be true to her story. And the bull arrived at the slaughterhouse with these broken hips, it was sort of the end of the day, and so the workers were, you know, tired. It's coming to the end of their shift. Now, I don't know if you've ever been anywhere near a cow or a bull, but they are very large animals, um, not the type of animal that you can pick up and move. And so in order to get this animal off the truck, they used an electric prod, a cattle prod, which is a device that delivers a zap. It's uncomfortable for the animal. And so they used this cattle prod to try to force the animal to drag itself off the truck. And they successfully got the animal through force, through this torturous device, to drag itself to the back of the truck and then onto the pavement below the truck. Because it needs to be off the truck, right? The truckers don't work at the slaughterhouse. They bring the cow, the animals to slaughter, and then they go off to, you know, to continue on their on their route. These are typically, there's contracts between um, the companies that provide the animals and the, the trucking companies and the slaughterhouses. These are all different companies. It's not typically integrated. Right. And so this animal was, you know, collapsed on the ground, finally in the slaughterhouse after much, I'm sure, you know, pain and fear and suffering. And but now it's the end of the day. So the workers are streaming out. The shift is over. There will be no more killing. And this um, animal is left on the floor of the slaughterhouse overnight with broken hips alone and um, and in pain. And that story really stayed with me. You know, even now, it, I find it so heartbreaking. I've always been... Um, a sensitive person. And the idea of physical pain, I think is awful. But even worse than that, I think sometimes for me is to imagine somebody's emotional pain, just the fear and loneliness that this animal would have been experienced and the confusion of who, you know, why are they doing this to me? And does anybody see that I'm suffering? Um, And this just, I mean, it truly broke my heart in a way that I could just never come back from. And I thought, no, absolutely not. No, no way. I not only do I want to go vegan, but I need to be become an activist and, you know, dedicate my life to speaking up for, for these animals and, and showing that there's another way. I know it was a long time ago, but do you know if that was a true story or was it something that she was relating? Yeah, it was a true story. It was, um, it was documented by a whistleblower, which is actually common because I think in this industry, in a lot of cases, and I saw this later through my work um, as a lawyer in these in, in these industries, working for nonprofits that were um, undercovering these industries, that a lot of the times the workers are, you know, they don't. It's not like they love working at slaughterhouses right. or love. Um, doing this work because it's, it's, it's hard. It's emotionally hard. It's physically hard. It's, it can be quite dangerous, especially dealing with large animals. It can be very dirty. Um, especially, I mean, you know, it it can all be very dirty, but certain of the industries are particularly, um, dirty and filthy. The, The workers have to be covered head to toe in outfits that need to be changed and laundered each, each time they take a break. And it's not the kind of job that people voluntarily go to. And many times I have a lot of empathy actually for the workers because many times they'll say, you know, I am so horrified by what I see. Many times they'll actually become vegetarian, if not forever, at least for the few weeks after they start before they become desensitized to what they're seeing. So it's not uncommon to find whistleblowers who really want to tell somebody what, what it is that they're seeing. Now, when you read that Blood Relations by Charlotte Montgomery, how did you feel when you read that? Well, I mean, for me, it was a really big wake up because although I had been, you know, mostly vegetarian, vegetarian for most of my life, I 
I really felt like I had been hit with a bucket of cold water. I was really disturbed by what I was finding out and I felt betrayed. I felt like I had been told lies by, you know, the government with its food guide and by teachers with these books and by even by culture, just with these friendly songs about animals. And, and certainly I saw a lot of that later as a vegan parent, the extent to which we're really immersed in a story about what animal agriculture looks like. And it's a false narrative. And it doesn't seem like there's a lot of interest from powerful, um, you know, people and organizations and bodies that we, sh I, up until then had had no reason to doubt. Um, so it was, it really was paradigm shifting. I mean, it's a, it's a simple story, but for me, it completely changed the way that I saw and understood the world around me. I mean, suddenly it was like, who, what information can I trust? And then to make matters worse, when you start to just kind of calmly tell the truth, you are a radical and extremist. And, and it was very, um, you know, very difficult and dissociating for me, me who had always been, you know, kind of a people pleaser and didn't want to, I, I, I've always sort of done things my own way, but I haven't been somebody who's like to, you know, be a, be a bad dinner guest or something like right. that. And so all of a sudden I was like, and what I thought actually was, my God, I can't believe this is happening. If only people knew, if everyone knew, everyone would, of course, just go vegan. I thought it would be so simple. Yeah. Um, and I was really, um, you know, disheartened when I found out that that wasn't the case. And so I had to relearn my love for humanity again, navigating through that to realize, wow, okay, like, this is a litmus test here and we don't have to, I, I had often, you know, as, as I mentioned, I've always been a big reader. And so I'd read a lot about historical injustices, um, slavery and world war two and, and, and times in history where just absolutely atrocious things have been happening to people. And I, like many people have thought, you know, what would I have done if I had been living at that time? Would have, I have had, would I have been one of the people who really had the courage to, to stand up against these horrific practices. And then when confronted with animal agriculture, I, I thought, okay, I can't change any historical injustices, but here is a modern day injustice that I can do something about every day, three times a day. And it was, yeah, it was a bummer for me, honestly, when I realized that not everybody felt the same way that I did. Um, but I, you know, now, now many years later, I understand that people have, people are inherently good, I believe, and are doing their best and, um, people have different priorities. And so I've started to, you know, to, to love people again, as they're, as they're fumbling, as we're all fumbling through this life, doing our best. Why do you think that is that it's so difficult, something so simple as just changing the food on your plate? Why is it so difficult for people to do that? Yeah, you know, I've thought about that a lot. And I think it's, it's really a combination of factors. I think that, um, I think that there's a lot that's going on. So for me, I always remind myself, I was fairly young when I changed my diet. And so I was, I mean, a lot of things were changing in my life all the time and it probably felt easier for me. I can imagine if somebody is more stuck in their ways, is more, um, has more habits around how they eat and what they eat, it might be more difficult. I also didn't have a family really to, to think about. So somebody who might have a husband who, and my, and I did have my, my partner, my husband who also became vegan with me, but I can imagine if somebody is learning about this and they have a partner who's not on board, kids who are not on board, parents who are not on board, you know, that adds some complications. Um, the power of, of, of culture and tradition can be very difficult for people. So for me, you know, not having turkey at Christmas, I don't care. But you know, some people do. Some people really do care. And this, to them, signifies family and togetherness, and they hold on to those old traditions. So I think that there's um, a lot of different ways that people sort of hold on to the familiar and to the traditional um, and are afraid to step outside of what they know. And then I think we also, you know, there's a human tendency to, to sort of forget about what's going on, sort of like willfully forget or to minimize what, what's happening. Like maybe somebody will watch a documentary and be very moved by it or read a book and be very moved by it and want to take action. But then the weeks go by and you sort of like forget it, forget the details and slip back into old ways. And your friends want to go out and they're ordering, you know, your old favorite, whatever animal dish, and you just kind of slip back into it. So I think that our challenge is to demonstrate that, um, 
that actually being vegan is delicious and rewarding. It has its own rewards, having these kind of, you know, shifting the way that we eat, you know, choosing new habits for Christmas can make the, the Christmas table more beautiful and more festive if, you, if only you have sort of an open mind and an open heart. What do you think is the best way to change people's minds? I mean, obviously it's difficult and no one's going to change their mind unless they want to. But what do you feel is the best way to change people's minds? So I think I have a few a few thoughts on that. Um, one is that I was very um, moved by Martin Luther King's biography, talking about his activism through the civil rights um, the civil rights era, and he he just did such an such an incredible job of being very firm in his message and his approach, but also never losing the love and compassion that he had for sort of humanity, not for individuals in every moment. Right. Um, but he, he continued to be speaking from a place of love and compassion. And I think that that is the, the right approach to take. So as I, as I always say, and I say to my kids, have, have love in your heart. You know, there's lots of different ways to express it. What would love do have love in your heart, but to start from that place of truly, um, feeling that compassion. We all know what that feels like because we all have those better angels of our nature and not allowing ourselves to sink into anger and lashing out. And although, you know, the anger and the frustration are very natural and normal responses to finding out what's going on with animals, but we need to transmute that into into action and um, and it needs to be love-based because nobody wants to hear to hear our angry rantings. Nobody wants to be made to feel guilty. As right as we might think we are, people are going to tune us out. Um, and, you know, take it from me as somebody who loves to debate <laughs> and mm-hmm. even worked as a lawyer for many years. I have completely, as a personal policy, stopped arguing because I realize that there is no such thing as winning an argument. I mean, you can either you win the argument and the person feels bad about themselves and doesn't want to think about you anymore because they feel stupid or embarrassed or, you know, or you don't win and you've just gotten this person to dig their heels in psychologically into their position. So I've really shifted in my approach and no, you know, no more debating as satisfying as that might be sometimes. And as good as it feels to be right, sometimes I think it's really important to find an approach that doesn't make people want to turn you out or to dig into their positions. That's not to say that there is no room for a healthy and honest and open-hearted debate. But I mean, I'm, I'm particularly thinking about on the internet when we're encountering people, we might not have a, a relationship with and where the debate can very quickly devolve into, you know, personal attacks and um, kind of, you know, lose the plot very quickly. So I think it is really important to approach people the way that we would want to be approached with love, approached with love and, um, and with information, but not in a way, you know, in a way that is respectful of of, um, of who we are and the information that we need at any time. So that's going to look different in every situation for every relationship, depending on what the person might need to hear. What I typically do is I just tell my story because my story can't be wrong. So I can say what, you know, the steps that I went through to become vegan and what I learned and how it made me feel. I can't tell you or anybody else how you're going to feel, how you should feel. And that's not my place to, but I can tell my story. Um, and maybe somebody will hear something in that, that they can relate to in a way that's disarming for them. And that doesn't put them on the spot or make them feel like they need to dig their own heels in, in order to win an argument. Yeah, it's very true. No one, no one wins an argument. (laughs) No, there is no winning. That is one of my true beliefs that, like you said, somebody just gets upset or they just dig their heels in. Again, there's no changing someone's personal opinion. They have to want to change and they have to take a look at information and, and decide to change. Exactly. And they need to arrive there in their own time and they'll feel good about themselves if they arrive there in a way that feels like they have arrived there and not like they've been forced into it. So I think our role as advocates is to provide the information. I mean, we don't want to be keeping our mouths shut and to be like closeted vegans. You know, I, I, again, I always go back to Martin Luther King's living example of yes, be loud and be proud, but, but do it in a way that invites people in and makes people excited and inspired by what you're doing. And so for me right now, that takes the form of sharing food and sharing not just food, but specifically how 
how I make it work with a young family getting dinner on the table every night when your kids are small and you're busy um, and you need crowd pleasing meals that don't take a lot of time or mental bandwidth to make, you know, but everybody's going to have a different sort of skill or, um, or just passion that they're, that they're excited about. It might be a podcast for some, right? It might be, <laughs> um, it might be journalism for, for others, but there's many different ways of speaking speaking about it, I just think it's important that we check in with ourselves before we deliver the message. Is this, am I motivated by anger or am I motivated by love? As far as your story, what are some of the positive changes that you did see both mentally and physically? Well, physically, I had always struggled with heartburn. And when I stopped eating cheese, I totally eliminated heartburn. I, I used to always have antacids and no longer, I, I mean, I, I haven't had to use them in however many years I've been vegan now. So that was a nice surprise. I think just the high concentrated saturated fat was really not sitting well in my stomach. Um, but, you know, other than that, I, I was a fairly healthy vegetarian other than that. So I didn't have much in the way of needing to correct any imbalances, uh, any sort of like health, health issues or anything like that. I will say, though, that now that I'm approaching 40 and, you're, and we're starting to think more about our bodies getting creaky and energy getting lower, I haven't really been dealing with any of that. I, I'm still fit. Um, I have no trouble maintaining a healthy weight that I've been since I was a teenager. Um, I, I feel good. I sleep well. So, you know, I don't I, I like to attribute that at least partly to my healthy plant based diet. Um, so that's nice. And I've also seen in my parents who have now become mostly vegan as well, they're 70, they're both 70, and they're doing fantastic. They're both very active and energetic as well. Um, both of them fairly easily lost weight when they transitioned to this diet and then maintained a healthy weight for them. So that's nice to see. They're both just sharp and energetic, and that's great. Now, mentally for me, the big thing was that I really felt as though a weight had been lifted off my shoulders. And I heard somebody talking the other day, um, I, now I forget who it was, I wish I could attribute this, but it was a, a spiritual leader talking about how, when, how, um, when we, so something like veganism, some people might say, well, it's so restrictive and you're really closing off options. And that's really not how I felt. And this, this spiritual speaker was saying, picture a kite when a, when a kite is limited by its string, that's actually not a limitation. That's, that's giving the kite its lift and its sort of joie de vivre. If the kite doesn't have a string, it just floats off and there is no kite. And that's kind of, and I thought that's how I feel about, about veganism is it gives my life shape and meaning and perspective. And it, um, it gives me so many ideas about food and more than that, about who I want to be. Um, which is I want to be a kind and compassionate person who lives my values. So I think that when I, when I went vegan, it felt very exciting that I could, uh, that I could eat and live with purpose. I mean, I think we all want to have a purposeful life. And I know that research shows that having something meaningful or purposeful in our lives helps, helps us um, feel vital. I mean, you look at the blue zones, which ha have been, I don't know, our, I don't know if you know, but yeah. our zones around the world where people are living unusually long lives or the more people are living to be, to be older or longer, to be <laughs> more people are living longer there. And one of the factors that research ident researchers identified is, um, is this meaningfulness in their life. And for some, it might be a religious or spiritual thing for others that might be, you know, a passion that they're passionate about or something like that. But whatever it is, there is this common thread and that people have a reason for getting up in the morning. And that is how that, how I felt it really started to animate my life. And as somebody who had long been interested in issues of justice, but who felt very frustrated by the fact that there was really nothing I could do about some of the justice issues that I would read about in the paper or be volunteering on in different nonprofits and charities, it was, it felt very frustrating. You know, there's nothing you can do to end you know, domestic violence or something like that, really, no, there's nothing I can do. But when it comes to how animals are treated, there is something I can do. And there's something I can do every single time I eat. So it felt intoxifying that every time I ate, I was making the world a better place, which is something that I've always really valued. That's so true. Aligning your values with your plate. Yeah, exactly. Do your parents eat a whole food plant-based diet or are they like me, junk food vegans? <laughs> 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 I'd say they're somewhere in the middle. They, um, 
they, yeah, they eat lots of vegetables and different soups and curries and hummus and that kind of thing. But they also don't shy away from Beyond Burgers. I mean, you know, and neither does my family. My, my, the rest of my family has Beyond Burgers once a week on Fridays and we make fries in the air fryer. And I typically, um, just because I prefer, I'll make like tacos or something like that and we'll all eat together. But yeah, my parents are definitely, definitely into some of those fabulous meat options that are, um, more available now. And I think if, if that works for you, absolutely go for it. Like the, the point is to, is to do better in our lives and also to eat in a way that makes us feel good. And if you feel good eating something by all means continue. Um, and certainly I, I love to cook like a couple of beyond sausages into a pasta or a soup once in a while, you know, more than once in a while. Um, it's just that the, yeah, the bulk of my diet is, is the beans and lentils. You mentioned that cheese was difficult as far as when you were vegetarian. Did you struggle with that once you became vegan? Well, I think I was lucky in a way because there really wasn't vegan cheese at that time. This was even before Daya came out. And Daya was sort of like the first commercial cheese that was actually a success and not just like a sorry excuse for, right. uh, for um, like stinky sweat sock cheese slab. But, um, and even day I actually, I don't love, I'm sorry. To, I, I, truth be told, I actually am totally over my cheese, my cheese addiction. But back in those days, I think I was lucky that there weren't really vegan cheeses to try because I think I would have been disappointed. I was a big cheese lover and I love to go to the cheese shop and pick out my stinky cheese to, <laughs> to snack on. <laughs> and I made grilled cheese and mac and cheese and I just really love cheese. So if I, I think if I had gone vegan and tried out the vegan cheeses, I probably would have been disappointed. But because I was so motivated by my sort of emotional relation to the animals that I was thinking of, cheese just became gross to me. It, it sort of became like a, emotionally disgusting to me. Like it was like a lump right. in my throat the last time I ate cheese. But um, but now actually I'm very put off by the idea of cheese. If I'm in a supermarket and I pass by the cheese section, it smells disgusting to me. It oh. smells like a stinky locker room or a hockey bag that needs to be washed. <laughs> and I'm just like, that is so gross. Like it just doesn't appeal to me anymore. So once I kind of wean myself off of it, um, I just totally lost interest in it. And now actually I do enjoy once in a while I'll buy like a nice cultured, nut cheese with um, maybe made from like almonds or cashews and with like a coconut oil component as well. There are some really fabulous ones. Um, they're just kind of like a special occasion food. Sometimes I'll enjoy them on toast with a tomato and some, you know, watercress or something like that. And that's really wonderful, but it doesn't form, it doesn't form a huge part of my diet. And also largely now I've replaced the role of cheese with, um, well, with lots of different things, but a lot of it with tofu, like different forms of tofu, like in a sandwich, for example, instead of a cheese sandwich, I might make a, a sandwich with baked tofu or smoked tofu or something like that. And it's also very easy to make a delicious cheese sauce with um, with a base of potatoes, which yeah. are so starchy that when you blend the potatoes, they become, they have that kind of like gelatinous quality that melted cheese has. And I love that. And I also love that after I eat it, I feel good. I can eat a big bowl of mac and cheese, a vegan mac and cheese made from whole plant foods and get up after and, you know, do just dance with my kids or, you know, <laughs> go do something and not be like, oh, I need to like lay on the couch and like take it, take it and tass it and go to bed early. Like I love feeling good and I love having, having that energy. And I think once you start to realize what food can do for your body and you feel good, you start to crave it. Um, I don't know, you know, if it's physical or psychological or a little bit of both, but I, I sincerely find myself craving a big green salad with sweet potatoes and beans and, you know, like a nice salty dressing. And that, that to me is, is truly like a feel good food now. I think that once you start to eat better, your body just starts to crave the healthy food. Yeah. And I've read that after a couple of weeks of eating a new food, your gut bacteria changes and your gut bacteria are connected to, to your mind, of course. So, you know, we're increasingly we're learning more about this. And so I think if it's not already known, maybe one day we'll find out that um, the gut bacteria really are signaling to our brain, get more of that, you know, arugula salad or whatever, <laughs> which at first might sound to somebody who's, who's not used to it disgusting. But if only they can just sort of find a way to stick with it for a couple of weeks by you know, easing it into the diet or using a really delicious salad dressing or bulking it up with things that you already do love, um, you might just find yourself surprising yourself and being and craving something that you didn't ever think would be possible. 
they have said that the gut is the second brain, which I find very mm-hmm. interesting. Yes, there's a lot of connections. And we've all experienced this, right? Like if you have nervousness, you might feel it in your gut. Um, I've also read that 80% of our immune system is located in our gut. So there's a lot going on down there. And, you know, what, <laughs> what we eat, I think, is really having a big impact on how we feel. I always get into this, you are what you eat, right? Mm -hmm. That's what everybody says. And then you start to think of it on a cellular level and you start (laughs) to think, literally, (laughs) I'm literally what I eat. Yeah, exactly. Well, it's really true. And I mean, it's so funny because it seems like that should be such like, of course we are what we eat and what we eat is our fuel. But I can remember a time and I'm sure you can remember a time too, when nobody really batted an eye about, you know, a diet of sort of steady, like microwave meals and convenience foods and very little in the way of, of fruits and vegetables. And that was just kind of normal. That was what everyone did. And I think our awareness around food has really changed a lot in the last, I don't know, 20 or 30 years that I think people more than ever really understand like how we eat is going to have an impact on how we feel. I really want to get into uh, what you feed your kids. Usually I just kind of do the same thing that I did when I wasn't vegan, you know, are right. there, yeah. what are some of the suggestions that, that you have for parents? Okay. So you know, it's going to, it's going to depend. My kids have been vegan their whole lives. So it's all they've ever known. So I think for some parents who might be transitioning their kids, it's going to look a little different than for people who might be starting a family or who might be in a little bit of a different situation. So let me just kind of see if I can address both of that. But what I do with my family is I have, um, I have cooking themes. So for Monday to Thursday, I have a specific cooking theme. Monday is pasta. Tuesday is bowls. Wednesday is one pot meals, soups and curries and stuff like that. And then Thursday is stir fries or stir fry type meals. Then on Fridays, as I mentioned, we do a burgers and fries night and mommy makes whatever she wants for dinner, which is often something (laughs) spicy or, you know, whatever, something that the kids wouldn't want to eat. And then on weekends, we typically coast on leftovers or we see, you know, family or friends for a meal. We, we make a big brunch. And so that kind of takes, it kind of takes the, the primary role of the big meal. Um, we do more snacking and eating different things. Um, breakfasts are typically, my husband and I typically both have a smoothie. And then my kids have, I, usually I make them um, waffles with oats, just like oats and soy milk and chia seeds is their, their go-to breakfast these days. Mm -hmm. And then for lunch, we all kind of also do different things. It's typically leftovers or, um, simple things. So like a sandwich or, uh, I like to make chickpea crepes from chickpea flour and water. Um, I often will make myself a salad. The kids will have Um, yeah, something simple like a toast with peanut butter and jam. It can be as simple as that. Um, and then it'll always be like cut up fruit and cut up raw veggies. Um, my kids are veggie lovers because they've grown up eating them, but just to make sure that I'm really upping the veggies that they eat typically when they're hungry before dinner, I will put out, and this is a trick I learned from my parents. I will put out a plate of raw veggies, carrot sticks, raw bell peppers, red, red and yellow and orange peppers, cucumber and celery. And maybe sometimes some apple as well. And they'll just snack on that and get their veggies in. So typically we eat kind of the same thing for dinner. So I've got a lot of family friendly meals. Um, On pasta night, it's going to be something like a cashew cream pasta or a red sauce. Sometimes I'll go, you know, the extra mile and make a lasagna with a nice, um, like a tofu walnut ricotta and a nice cashew cream topping. Or I do a pesto, like a simple pesto, which is a really good way actually of making greens a bit more palatable to kids. My kids are definitely not going to sit down and eat a kale salad, but they will sit down and eat a kale pesto on pasta. So that's one way of getting more greens into kids. Um, On Tuesdays, that's when we have bowls. So it'll be like rice and beans or maybe like a sheet pan meal with potatoes and chickpeas and then serve it on more lettuce for the kids, less uh, more lettuce for the adults, less lettuce for the kids and maybe some kind of simple sauce. Um, One pot Wednesdays. So I really love to make soups. I make a tomato based soup or a coconut milk based soup or a potato based soup. Um, just, you know, you can throw in whatever veggies and spices that you have. Soup is a really easy and forgiving meal. I really actually like making it as the primary cook of my family because I can make a giant pot. It's only one pot. You can really throw in whatever you kind of need using up like half a jar of tomato sauce or that half head of cauliflower that's looking a little sad or whatever you might have. 
Right. And then Thursdays are stir fries, and those are so easy. It's typically tofu based in my family, but that's also where we have peanut noodles, which is a really fantastic family friendly meal. Nobody mm. I've, that I've met doesn't love peanut noodles. And if you're allergic to peanut butter, you can use tahini instead, which is a sesame seed based paste. Um, yeah, and that's our that's our typical week. I, I I definitely keep it simple. I really like to cook. For me, it's a creative process, and I enjoy it. But I do not like to spend more time than I have to doing anything, and that goes for cooking as well. So, like multi step, complicated meals. I'm not making like side dishes that involve like broiling and this and that. I mean, I'm just like, how can I make a lot of food like really quickly? <laughs> I love some of those cookbooks that have, oh, you have three hours to make this meal. And I'm like, I, I don't have that kind of time. Mm -hmm. So uh, let's, let's no. get into uh, your current venture, which is the Vegan Family Cookbook. Yeah. So that all started because when I was working as um, an animal law campaigner, I was encountering a lot of people who really didn't know what to eat. They were interested in what I was saying about, um, about animal agriculture and about veganism, but they just didn't know where to start. And I thought, hmm, that's so funny because there are so many vegan cookbooks out there and so many vegan blogs and you can just Google anything, you know, vegan lasagna, vegan bolognese, vegan pierogies, vegan whatever, and you can find a million recipes to choose from. And so I thought like, what is it that's going on here that because obviously what people need is not recipes because we have recipes. The world does not need more recipes. Right. And what I realized is that I think a lot of what um, cookbooks provide, as you said, a lot of them are too complicated. And most people at 530 after a long day aren't like going to pull out a cookbook and read through a recipe and get the measuring cups dirty. And like, it takes a lot of mental bandwidth. Right. Plus it's kind of like a chore, right? Like if you're following a recipe to the letter and you have to make sure you have everything. So it requires some advanced planning or a trip to the store. And so I, I became very interested in, and I'm also interested in this as like a reader and as a consumer of media, like what do people actually eat? Like what do people really eat when, um, you know, outside of the cookbooks and the pretty social media feeds and the Pinterest boards and the Instagrams with like the artfully arranged acai <laughs> And, bowl and do they whatever. actually like, eat those like, things? <laughs> yeah. Like, do you have cereal for breakfast and like hummus and crackers for lunch and like <laughs> pasta and marinara for dinner? Like, is that actually what you eat? Like I really want, you know, wanted to know. Um, because I just think that's really interesting. The stories about people and, and what we eat for real and like, and why we do that. So not only am I interested in that as, as just, you know, as a human, but I also thought this is going to be really valuable and useful for people. So I set out to share it. I just created an Instagram account and I just shared what we were really eating. And I would share like non recipes. I would, I was like, eh, a little of this, little of that, you know, kind of like wing it and just encouraging people to just feel a bit more creative and resourceful in the kitchen. I would talk about you know, pulling out things that were half used because also food waste is a big problem. That's, you know, not, not exactly related to animal issues, but it's certainly related to climate change and just our food system in general. Sure. Um, so just kind of like all of the information that I had learned the hard way through trial and error, I just began to sort of walk people through it. And Instagram came out with Instagram stories, which was a great blessing for me because I found that it was a very good an easy way of sharing. I would just cook dinner in my stories. I would just record what I was doing. And now I'm adding the onions and now I'm adding the carrots. <laughs> and now I'm going to whisk the sauce together. I'm not measuring it, but here you can see I'm pouring in a little bit of this and I'm pouring in a little bit of that. Um, and people really responded well to it. It was easy for me to do it, integrated well into my life. And people were really responding well to sort of the realness of it. And also, I think the the liberating nature of it, like, yeah, I don't need to like, oh, follow another recipe tonight. I'm so tired of recipes. So people were sending me a lot of messages saying, I love this. This has made it easier for me to go vegan. I have become a, you know, a more resourceful cook. Because I think another thing about getting people to go vegan, sort of another peripheral issue aside from food waste is just home cooking. Like getting people eating at home is a good way of making it easier for people to to fend for themselves, to be vegan and to eat healthfully and to, to not waste food and all of the, those good things. So the Instagram account grew and it continued to be very gratifying for me. And eventually um, I was connected with a publisher who thought this would make a great book. And I... I had to agree after some sort of getting used to the idea that instead of um, doing law for a while, I was going to be doing a cookbook for a while because I have limited time as I'm also homeschooling my kids um, <laughs> and just need to spend time with them while they're, while they're small and they still want to hang out with me. 
so yeah, so then I, I wrote the cookbook and I really tried to make it very useful. I definitely knew from day one, you know, I mean, this for me is a passion project. I'm not out there to try to make a book that people will buy. I am just truly trying to be of service to the animals and to vegans and to, and to plant, you know, plant curious people to try to make something useful. So with the book, I, I did include recipes, but I also included lots of healthy notes about how to adapt and vary the recipes. And I also include lots of instructions like how to make things without recipes. So how to make soup without a recipe, my template for making a good bowl, um, how to prepare tofu so that it's, you know, you actually want to eat it because tofu is such a delicious and convenient option. It's very easy to stir fry um, or bake for sandwiches or to just snack on or to have in a salad. So, you know, learning how to prepare it is really important and you don't really need a recipe. You just need to, you know, you just need to know how to, how to, how to cook it, swap it out for something else. So I hope that in the book, what people find is really a manual for, how to make vegan eating easier. And a lot of my audience is not families. There are people who are are older and younger and, you know, living alone or whatever, living in different ways. And the book is absolutely going to be useful for everyone. I geared it towards vegan families simply because that's where I was at in this stage of life when I was conceiving of the book and kind of creating the recipe. So I wrote about the time in my life when I was a busy you know, working professional with two small kids at home that I was also caring for full time. And I shared what I learned about how to provide for my family healthy meals and not get burnt out on the kitchen. So I think that there's going to be something in there for everyone, but certainly new new parents, I hope, will will find that it gives them um, just the, the push in the right direction that they need to feel confident and excited about cooking for their families. Yeah, it sounds like a great book. It Thank really, you. it really does. So. As a parent, you know, I'm, I'm sitting here and I'm listening and I'm like everything from the plate of veggies before dinner, just kind of lay that out. And you're just like, Oh, that's simple. Yeah. I, mean, yeah. I, I, I mean, think of that. Yeah, I can do that. I can, I can cut up some veggies like uh, nobody's business. <laughs> totally. Yeah. Who can't cut veggies, right? And like I and I say in my book, like in the part where I'm talking about how to pack a kid's lunchbox, I'm like one of that's one of the things that I say, like, don't overthink it. Like I personally would love like roasted carrots with like the carrot top pesto and a set whatever, like on a bed of polenta. But like my kids are like carrot sticks. Carrot sticks are fine. Plain carrot sticks. Like right. don't don't overthink it. Like give them the carrot sticks. Like that is very simple to do. Now, when somebody tells you that you help them go vegan, how does that make you feel? Yeah, I mean, it's very gratifying. It's the work that I set out to do all of these years ago. And, um, and to, to have found this fantastic outlet for doing it is very meaningful. And it's also been so wonderful to see just how the movement has taken on life of its own. I also know that for a lot of people, you're going to be just one, you know, one nudge on their journey. And so even when I don't hear from people that I had a direct role in their personal journey, I know that every time we share, we follow our sort of our gut and our passion to create something useful and of service in the world, it, it's going somewhere positive. It might only have an effect on one person. It might have an effect on thousands or millions of people, but but it all counts. It all matters and it all makes a difference. And you know, not only is it just, I think, inherently good to be doing something useful in the world, but it just feels really darn good. It feels good and exciting and energizing to be creating goodness in the world. Yeah. Just kind of leading by example, right? Totally. Yeah. Now, can you give us a few simple tips on what you do to help prepare your family lunches? Yes. So I always think of it in terms of, um, a grain or starch, Uh, a concentrated protein source, a fruit and a veggie. And then there's usually some kind of treat in there. Um, And so that's going to look different, obviously, for different kids, depending on their preferences and for different kids, depending on their ages as well. Older kids might be able to eat different things than younger kids who kind of need more of the finger foods. Um, And also just like on the restrictions of the school. So my kids go to a school one day a week because they are homeschooled the rest of the time. And at their school, there's no peanut restrictions, which is great for my peanut butter loving kids. So I can pack them a peanut butter sandwich, which is really simple. Um, But I do a lot of, I don't actually always do sandwiches and that's, um, you know, for a variety of reasons. Sandwiches are great if that works for you. But for my kids, they really like sort of snacky finger foods. So I'll usually do um, a raw veggie or a raw veggie. So it might be 
um, some, you know, grape tomatoes and cucumbers, and then I'll do a cut up fruit, maybe grapes, apple, I mean, anything really. The, the sky's the limit with fruits and also it changes seasonally and it's going to vary from kid to kid. My kids just happen to really love apples. We buy like six pounds of apples at a time. It's it's unholy. The amount of apples they go through, I actually wow. can't believe it. We have a fruit bowl just for apples. <laughs> <laughs> Um, or banana, right? Like banana is a really easy thing to pack for kids who like to eat bananas. Um, and then for a concentrated protein source, we really like tofu. I know I- I've heard through my Instagram um, audience that in the United States, you can't get smoked tofu, which is a huge bummer because it's something that we really lean on in our family. My kids love to eat it. I actually really like to eat it too. But if you can't access smoked tofu, you can also make baked tofu or you can look for a kind of a marinated tofu or something else delicious like that because baked tofu is really quite delicious. It's chewy, um, especially if you bake it for a long time. And you can just you know coat it simply with some soy sauce and bake it at 400 for 20 minutes flip and then another 15 minutes and that's you know do two blocks of tofu at a time and you'll have finger foods for the week um hummus or other bean dips are another really good and easy one or um or you can use like chickpea flour to make crepes or you know that kind of thing so something like that and then um and then a whole grain or start something that's going to fill them up so i'll uh, sometimes at the beginning of the week i'll make Um, I use oats to make muffins or a quick bread or something simple like that. If I haven't done that, I don't have the time, you know, maybe toast or a rice cake or, um, something that's going to be filling when my kids are a little older, then it'll be probably, they'll get more into my kids are five and eight. So they're, they just really love that kind of finger food. Um, but yeah, when they're a little older, I think it'll be more about thermos food, the thermos food leftovers. Those are really easy, especially things like soups transport very well in thermoses. They don't you know, pasta, maybe not always so well, um, stir fries, not necessarily so well, but, but soups or curries, chilies, that kind of thing are fantastic in thermoses. And they're also really, really easy to make vegan because beans and lentils shine in a, in a soup or a stew or a curry where they just soak up the flavor and you can really just, I mean, you don't even have to cook them from dry. You can just crack open a can, dump them in the pot. And it's, it's really as simple as that. Now, what is one of one habit that helps you stay on track with your plant-based diet? Uh, I would say cooking at home. We really, as a family, don't eat out uh, or we very rarely eat out. And I think that just makes it very easy because we know how to (laughs) fend for ourselves. Um, We're always really well equipped with groceries. So we um, are always eating nutritious and delicious food that is totally to our specifications and to our liking. Um, I will say though, that for, for people who are in the habit of getting a lot of takeout food, I totally get it. I've been there. I used to actually be, I think, addicted to getting takeout food. I think I was addicted to the high salt and fat content, Mm -hmm. but just like anything, once you wean yourself off that flavor profile, now I find when I, when we get takeout, you know, for a special occasion, a birthday, or just because we feel like trying a new restaurant or something, we typically, my husband and I will always say like, wow, like I just don't feel that good. Like the food is almost like assaulting my taste buds. And afterwards I feel heavy. I feel tired. I don't feel that great. So, um, just kind of like weaning yourself off of that, the really intense flavor, flavor, um, of, of takeout food and learning to cook for yourself at home and to appreciate home cooked flavors can really make a big difference and make it easier for you. Plus then you can, you're easier as a, um, you can have like family dinners or friends over for dinner or go to people's houses and bring something delicious to share. And that's another great way of spreading the message. I, I love the way you have that planned out the Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, you know, pasta bowls, uh, stir fries, something like that is nice to have that structure. It's nice to have the structure because you don't, if you're just like, what's for dinner? I feel like I used to like around three o'clock, it would be like, what's for dinner tonight? Like it was such a drag every day. And just with that little bit of structure, like, you know, remember being in school and if if, if the teacher would say, okay, write an essay on this topic. It was like, you had a million ideas, but if somebody had just said, write an essay, you were just like, I don't know anything. (laughs) You know, I have no idea. And I feel like it's like that with food too, like pasta. Okay. And then you kind of mentally go through like, what, what pastas do we like? And what haven't we maybe had in a while? Um, it also makes it easier to just stop into the grocery store. Like I'm really not very, I'm, I'm somewhat organized, but I'm terrible at planning ahead. And I just don't enjoy it. I don't enjoy having to sit down on the weekend and like go through cookbooks and make a list and then what we're going to eat and then make a grocery list and, you know, power to the people who can do that. But I tried doing that and it really didn't work for me because it just felt like such a chore. And it also felt like, 
you, you know, you need to like really think every week, like how can we have things that kind of work together, but aren't too disparate. So we're not using lots of different things. And it was like a puzzle that you had to solve every week. And then if one weekend, God forbid, you didn't get to sit down to do it, it was like your whole week would be through. You'd have no plan for the week. <laughs> but having this plan, these themes really made things easier for me. Cause it's like, I can stop into the grocery store at 10 30 on a Monday and be like, okay, do I have what I need for pasta, yeah, I've got some cashews. We've got some pasta. Do I have what I need for bowls tomorrow? Oh, I've got some beans in the freezer, I think. Um, better pick up some rice, though, or whatever. Like, you can just kind of go through it like that. Like, make sure we have a tofu. Make sure we have um, some dry beans or some canned beans. Make sure we have a bit of pasta. Make sure we have some grains. Like, And then you can just really be flexible with how you do it. And my book, as well, is actually laid out according to those themes. So the chapters aren't, you know, dinner, appetizers, or whatever. It's, um, it's pasta Monday, bowl Tuesday. It's laid out like this to help people figure out what they're going to eat and when. That's fantastic. I can't wait for that book to come out. Oh, thanks. So I'll definitely email you when it's out. Thank you. All right. The Vegan Family Cookbook is the name of that book. Yeah. In case you missed it earlier. Speaking of cookbooks, what book or cookbook have you gifted the most to somebody transitioning to a plant-based diet? Well, I'm in a bit of a unique (laughs) situation because I don't use cookbooks myself. And instead of gifting people cookbooks, I just tell people to go to my Instagram. And once I do have my own cookbook, I'm going to be gifting people my book <laughs> if you don't already own it. So, but that's, pro- but I, what I can say is that, um, having, you know, flipped through cookbooks myself, there's, uh, America's test kitchen has a new book out, the complete plant-based cookbook. They just came out with it and I had a look at it through my library. Um, and I think it looks like a really good cookbook for people who are new to plant-based eating. It's got 570 plant-based recipes. America's Test Kitchen does a really great job of testing. They've got a whole team for people who don't know. They've got a whole team of people who test the recipes and tweak them until they're perfect. So they're really fully tested. You know, having flipped through it myself, I wasn't inspired to make anything, but that's just me. I mean, I just, I find other recipes. I look at them and I'm like, ah, I could, you know, I would do it differently. I just, I just have my own way of doing things. But I recognize that some people really like the recipes either for inspiration or just to follow as a template. And that's great. Everyone's different. Um, and so for that, I would say, have a look at the complete plant-based cookbook. Um, but there's, I mean, there's tons, there are so many great, uh, vegan cookbooks out there and different things are going to resonate with different people and at different times. So I would say, go to your library, go to the cookbook section and grab everything that catches your eye and just bring them home and read through them just to get inspiration, to see what, see what's speaking to you. And then maybe later you can buy the ones that you, you really like. Yeah, that's great advice. I have to uh, find out what my library has these days. <laughs> yeah, you know, a lot of people, it's so funny because a lot of people don't think of libraries for cookbooks, but even a smaller library will typically have like a fairly well-stocked cookbook section and libraries are pretty good about bringing in, at least my my library is good about bringing in like all the vegan titles. So it's, um, there's like a disproportionate amount of vegan cookbooks relative to the other cookbooks, I think. Maybe it's just what, you know, people are really curious about. Even people who aren't going vegan are interested in eating more of more vegetables and more legumes and that kind of thing. Now, finally, can you give me one word to describe how you felt before you became vegan and one word to describe how you feel now that you are vegan? Hmm. Well, I think we've kind of, um, touched on this, but I think before I was vegan, the word that I would use is asleep. And now this would be in retrospect at the time I didn't feel asleep, but, but certainly now when I look back, I think, wow, I was really asleep there. And now I would say that my life feels meaningful. Uh, I love being vegan uh, and I love the way that it's shaped my life, the way that it's given me different connections, the way that it's giving me, you know, delicious food and opportunities and um, the way that that every day I feel like I can do something positive in the world, which which in turn makes me feel great. Asleep and meaningful. I love that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Such a pleasure speaking with you. Thank you so much for taking the time. Now, what's the best way for people to find you on Instagram, the web, social media in general? Yeah, so typically um, you can find me either on Instagram at instagram.com slash easyanimalfree. My handle is easyanimalfree. I also have a website, easyanimalfree.com. Um, anyone who wants to be kept up to date about the book, which is being published this year and should be available for pre-order, I think in the coming months, um, you can sign up for my newsletter uh, on my website, easyanimalfree.com, and I'll send out a little, I, I basically, I very rarely send out anything to the newsletter list, so don't worry about spam. Um, but yeah, I'll send out a, a little notice when the book is available. Oh, that's great. Thank you again. Thank you so much for being on Plant Your Seed. 
Thank you, Fred. My pleasure. And you asked wonderful questions, and it was such a, such a pleasure to talk to you as well. Hope you are inspired by this story. And remember, it's never too late to plant your seed. Links to everything we talked about on the podcast can be found on Instagram at plant.yourseed in the show notes tab in the bio. If you enjoyed the show, remember to leave us a review. And until next time, thank you for listening.